My name is Nancy Roberts. I'm an economics professor at Arizona State University, and today's topic is going to be public goods. Uh, public goods are have two characteristics, and we mistakenly think a public good is something that's good for the public because of its name, but we must stick to the uh, criteria that are essential for a good to be considered a public good. Number one, the good must be non-rivalrous in consumption and it must be non-exclusionary. Um, okay, so let's just talk about what we mean by these two characteristics of a public good. Um, when we say it's non-rivalrous in consumption, what we mean is that if one person consumes some of it, it doesn't leave less for others to consume. Um, most goods are rivalrous. I'm using this pen. You can't use this pen when I'm using this pen because it's being used. It's rivalrous in consumption. If I take an apple and eat it, there's less of that apple for you to eat. If I'm on the tennis court, there's goods, most goods are rivalrous. A few goods are non-rivalrous. Um, an example of something that's non-rivalrous would be a lighthouse. Um, if I'm out in the ocean sailing my ship and I see the lighthouse telling me, don't go near there, there's rocks, well, then I've gotten information from this lighthouse, but it doesn't keep anyone else from getting information from the very same lighthouse at the very same time. So it's non-rivalrous in consumption. Um, that's what we mean by that characteristic. The second characteristic, non-exclusionary, means either it's impossible or it's prohibitively expensive to exclude someone from consuming this good even if they didn't pay for it. Now, most goods are exclusionary. For example, if you want this pen, you go into the store and you pick up the pen and you go to the counter and you pay for it. And they can exclude you from taking this pen out of the store if you didn't pay for it. Of course, people could steal things and that happens, but in general, for example, you want to go to the movies. You want to, well, when you go in the door, you have to have a ticket to get in the door. They're not going to let you in. Um, so that's what we mean by non-exclusionary. An example of that, well, the lighthouse is an example of that. I don't care if you paid for it or not, you can see it. Um, national defense is another example of the non-exclusionary. National defense is paid for by taxpayers. And even if you aren't a taxpayer, if you are in America, and our national defense is protecting America from whatever, you can't be excluded even if you didn't pay for it. So. Uh, National defense meets this non-exclusionary characteristic. And so um, public goods present problems for the private market. Um, if the good is non-exclusionary, private industry is not going to provide the good. And the reason they're not going to provide it is anybody can consume it without paying for it. So. No profit maximizing firm is going to supply something that anybody can have if they didn't pay for it. So that creates a problem. Private markets don't provide public goods. Um, the non rivalry and consumption characteristic also pre presents problems because it makes it difficult to determine what the actual demand curve looks like. Look, these goods provide benefits to society. A lighthouse provides benefits. National defense provides benefits. But the question is, how much do we, the citizens, value a lighthouse? How much do we value a stealth bomber? We don't know because we never observed individuals buying stealth bombers or lighthouses. We know how much people value pens. We see you buy pens all the time. We don't know how much you value lighthouses or street lights, other things, that street lights is an example of something that's non-rivalrous and non-exclusionary. So we're not sure what the demand curve looks like. And so what I want to do now is illustrate the problem that public goods present in creating the demand curve. So 
we're going to have a society that has three people, um, Larry, Curly, and Mo. So, and the good in question would be streetlights. We consider streetlights a um, public good because I can stand under the streetlight and read my newspaper and it doesn't keep you from also doing the same thing. Um, so here we have Larry, we have Curly, and we have Mo. These are, this is my society. Larry has a demand for streetlights. So here's Larry. And here's Larry's demand for street lights. Lights. And here's. And Curly also has a demand for street lights. And Mo also has a demand for street lights. And there's no reason to expect they would have identical demands because as we learned earlier in the semester about demand, demand is based on uh, preferences and budgetary constraints. So the thing about a street light, so let's just put street lights in here. One, two, three, four, five street lights. One, two, three, two, three, four, five, six, seven street lights. Um, the thing about streetlights is this first streetlight, streetlight number one, can be enjoyed by Larry and Curly and Mo. So if we're trying to figure out what a streetlight is worth to this society, what we have to do is we have to include Larry's value plus Curly's value plus Mo's value for the first streetlight. This is exactly opposite of the way we have always constructed demand curves up to this point. The way we've just constructed demand curves up to this point, for example, apples. We were doing the demand for apples for Larry, Curly, and Mo. We would say, well, at a dollar, how many apples would Larry buy? At a dollar, how many apples would Curly buy? At a dollar, how many apples would Mo buy? So then we'd say one dollar and we'd add these up. We'd sum them up horizontally. What we are going to do now with public goods is we have to sum them up vertically. And so we say, okay, street light number one for Larry. Larry says street light number one is worth $20 to him. Curly says street light number one is worth $15 to him. Street light number one. And Mo says street light number one is worth $10 to him. And so if we're going to construct a market demand for this information, um, here's the quantity and here's the price or the market value. So one street light to this society is worth $20 plus $15 plus $10. So street light number one is worth $45. Street light number two is worth 15 to Larry, 5 to Curly, and 9 to Mo. So street light number two is worth 15 plus 5 plus 9. And we carry on with this. Street light number 3 is worth 12. Street light number 3 to Curly, he's not, there's nothing. He doesn't, he, he doesn't want it. It's too much light. He can't sleep at night with that many street lights. Street light number 3 is 7, let's say. So street light number three is worth 12 plus zero for curly plus seven. So that's how we construct a market demand curve for a public good. And then the question becomes, where will I draw my market demand? Okay, I'm going to do this. QP. Street light number one was 45. Street light number two was 29. Street light number three is 19. 
So I'm going to draw our market demand curve. One, two, three. And you see what we've done, streetlight number one, we've added up $20 for Larry plus $15 for Curly, so now I'm up to $35, plus $10 for Mo, so now I'm up to $45. So do you see how I've summed them up vertically? I've because each of them can enjoy the streetlight. It's non-rivalrous. Um, there's the first street light. The second street light is 15 and 5 and 9 or 7. So, and that turns out to be 29. Whoops, that's not drawn to scale. So that's 29. So, and street light number 3 is worth 19. So that's right here. So there's my market demand curve again stacking individual demands because it's a public good. And so then the question is, okay, assuming people have revealed their true preferences, in other words, this is really how much Larry values the streetlights. This is really how much Curly values the streetlights and Mo. Assuming they've revealed their true preferences, then what we could do to fund these street lights is charge them according to their preferences. Um, and let's say that street lights cost uh, $29 a piece. Let's just say that. They cost $29 a piece. So if they cost $29 a piece, this is the marginal cost, then two is the right number of street lights, right? Because that's where two equals uh, 29. That's where the demand is. Okay, so then we have to buy two street lights. That's the optimal amount, assuming these demand curves are correct. Then what we would do is we've got uh, sixty. We've got fifty-eight dollars worth of lights to buy, two lights at twenty-nine dollars a piece. We could split it three ways. Just take the fifty um, fifty-eight dollars and split it three ways equally. But Curly wouldn't like that. Because, I mean, the second street light's only worth five bucks to him. So another way, that, that would be called uh, equivalent um, payment. Another way we could do it is called Lindahl pricing. Pricing according to value. But, so we know that Larry has the biggest value, and so we would make him pay $15 per light. We'd make uh, Curly pay $5 per light, and we'd make Mo pay second $9 per light, and that way we would have our $58. But the problem with that method is you have to assume these people have revealed their true preferences. I mean, it's like if you think someone else is going to pay for the good or service, the temptation is to overstate your preferences. Oh, I, we need more streetlights to cut down on crime. I do this with tennis courts. I encourage the city of Coolidge to build more tennis courts. Keep the kids off the street. We're, you know, kids don't get enough activity. Build more courts. And of course, I don't live in Coolidge, and my taxes won't pay for that. If they said to me, how much are you willing to pay for new tennis courts, then they'd get a different response from me. So, and it's, it's the, the situation of, if someone else is going to pay for it, you tend to overstate your preferences. If you're going to have to share the cost and you're going to have to share the good itself, then you may understate. So this presents problems. Public goods present problems. Um, and there's no easy solution to these problems. It's very hard to estimate the demand curve. And government has to be involved because private industry won't provide public goods. Sometimes, private, like a dam is a public good. A dam holds back water from, saves everybody downstream. Um, but sometimes dams are built by private companies, but the government pays for them. In other words, the government will put out an RFP, a request for proposals, and these different companies will put in bids and say, well, I'll build the dam for this, and I'll build the dam for this. And so then the government will pick who they want to build the dam, 
And so it will be built, and it could even be maintained. It could be some kind of a contract with the government to maintain it. Public goods doesn't mean the government actually has to build and maintain, but they have to fund the building and the maintenance. So public goods are another problem where we, we have to have government intervention. The private market won't solve the problem. Thank you very much.